Hi folks, welcome to the Stats and Probability Review. Uh, a few little disclaimers here up on the screen. Uh, if you want to read through, just press pause. Here we go, topic six, stats and probability. Uh, so you need to be able to work with frequency tables, diagrams and box and whisker plots. Um, you need to be able to find mean, median, mode uh, by hand. If we're given this box and whisker plot, what does it tell us? Well, the box and whisker plot tells us the lowest value is 13, so the min is 13. The max would be 59, which in turn tells us the range. would be 46. It also tells us right here that the median is 32. So if you lined up all the values from lowest to highest, the middle number would be 32. The first quartile is 25, and the third quartile is 47, meaning the interquartile range is just 47 minus 25, or 22. That tells you that the middle 50% of data uh, lies between scores of 25 and 47. Look at this example here with uh, goldfish. Lifespans of pet of 200 pet goldfish are represented in the frequency table below. Uh, so zero to one years, four, we've got 40 goldfish. 77 live between one and two years. 32 between two and three. 28 between three and four, and 23 goldfish between four and five uh, and we're going to assume that uh, that none of them live longer than that though I know they could um, complete the following cumulative frequency table and draw a cumulative frequency curve so that's just adding up how many reach uh, a lifespan of a maximum of one year well there'd be 40 now a lifespan of a maximum of two years would be the 40 and the 77 if we add those together we get 117 Maximum of three years, well, that would be our first three, or just 117 plus this 32 gives us 149. Okay. Maximum of four years, add another 28 and you're at 177. And finally, add 23 and you're at 200. So we've accounted for all the goldfish by the time we hit five years. Uh, we're going to draw the cumulative frequency curve. So, uh, we need to label cumulative frequency over here. Uh, lifespan in years. And we're going to plot what we know. By the time we hit one year, we're at 40 goldfish. Two years, we're at 117, so that's around here. Three years, we're at 149, so that's about here. Four years, we're at 177, that's about here, and by five years, we're at our 200. Join them in a smooth curve, and there we go. All right, calculate the expected lifespan of a goldfish. So we've lost some information right off the get-go. We don't know how long each of these individual goldfishes lived. Uh, but we know that there were 40 between 0 and 1 years. Well, the average of 0 and 1 years would be 0.5 years. So we're going to use mid-intervals here. Grab our GDC, get it to do the actual calculation. So those 0 to 1 year uh, fish, we're going to call them 0.5 in terms of their average lifespan. 1 to 2, that's like 1.5. It's an average lifespan. This is the best estimate we can come up with as to the lifespans of these fish. Put in my frequencies, 40, 77. Really, I'm finding the mean here using the mid-intervals. They may let you know uh, in the test that they want you to use mid-intervals, or you may have to infer it. Stat, we're going to look at one variable statistics for this information, which I put in list 1 and list 2. What it's telling me is that the average lifespan is 2.09 years. The next thing we're asked for is the standard deviation. And we can find that right on the calculator. 
we've got 1.27 years. And that showed up right here. Next thing we're asked to do, use your cumulative frequency distribution to estimate the median lifespan of a goldfish to one decimal place. Well, we've got 200 goldfish. So the middle goldfish is like the 100.5th goldfish, or for all intents and purposes, the 100th goldfish. Let's figure out where that puts us on our cumulative frequency polygon. It looks to me like we're around uh, 1.7 or 1.8. Likely you get the mark either way. I'm going to go with 1.8 here, years. Again, we don't have the raw data for the lifespan of each goldfish, so this is the best we can do, is to use the cumulative frequency graph. A goldfish is considered mature if it's more than two years old. A goldfish is selected at random. This is where we're getting into the probability. What's the probability that it's not mature? So let's take a look up here. From our cumulative frequency graph, or a table rather, we can see that 117 goldfish are less than or equal to two years old. That's 117 out of 200. Or if you did that in your calculator as a decimal, or by yourself as a decimal, 0.585. Moving on, some probability terms just to be familiar with. If we see this A, U, B, that's the union of the sets A and B. It means A or B or both. Okay, so the U means the word or in the Boolean sense, one or the other or both. And it would correspond to this area on your Venn diagram, A or B or both. If you see this A with the sort of N looking thing, that means the intersection of A and B, which means and. So where in this diagram would we have A and B, both A and B? would be right here, where they intersect. Not all sets are going to intersect, though. We'll look at that a little more down below. P, A, line B. Well, the line means given that. So it reads the probability of the event A, given that B has occurred. The probability of event A, given that B has occurred, uh, is given by this formula called, called Bayes' theorem which we'll talk about a little bit below and put to use in the actual examples. But it tells you that a probability A, given that B, is the same as the probability of both over the probability of event B. Complementary events. OK. They're sort of opposite events. If the event A is being late for school, then its complement means not being late for school. And since an, occur, uh, an event is guaranteed to either occur or not occur, if you add up the probability of some event and its complement, you should get 1, and you always will. So this is true. Mutually exclusive events are events which cannot occur simultaneously. So if we consider a deck of cards and let uh, event A be drawing a club and B be drawing a red card, then in a single draw, those events are mutually exclusive because you can't have a card that's both a club and is red. All the clubs are black. For mutually exclusive events, we know that the probability of both is zero. That's essentially the definition of mutually exclu exclusive events. And if you wanted the probability of A or B, it would just be event A plus probability of event B. So in this case, if A is drawing a club and B is drawing a red card, We'd be looking at probability of a club, 13 out of 52, plus probability of a red card, 26 out of 52, which would give us 39 out of 52, or 0.75. Uh, notice if you drew the Venn diagram for mutually exclusive events, a, the circles for A and B wouldn't intersect. They'd be what's called disjoint sets. So they, since they don't intersect at all, the probability of both at the same time is zero. If events are not mutually exclusive, uh, then we have events that can occur simultaneously. So if we consider this deck of cards again and say C is drawing a heart and D is drawing a queen, then in a single draw, you can satisfy both of those conditions. You can get a card that's both a heart and a queen, namely the queen of hearts. For not mutually exclusive events, 
this is true. And it's actually true for mutually exclusive events as well. It looks a lot like our formula up above. Probability A or B is probability A plus probability of B. And we have to minus off the case of both because it's been really double counted uh, if you look at the, uh, at the Venn diagram which we will in a second. If you're not sure about exclusivity, always use this formula here. And this one's given in your formula booklet um, because it will work for mutually exclusive events as well. It's just you'll be minusing off or subtracting zero at the end. So let's take our uh, case here of drawing a heart or a queen. So probability of a heart is 13 out of 52. Probability of a queen there are four out of 52 that are queens. Minus the probability of both, there's one card that is both a queen and a heart. That would give us 16 out of 52 or four out of 13. If we wanted to draw the Venn diagram, which is definitely an easy way to approach this, you could look at it this way. Hearts, queens, there's one that's both, Three cards are just queens, and 12 cards are just heart, but not queens. That gives us our 16 cards out of 52. So you can see there the reason why we needed to minus off the one. If I count them here, and then count them again, meaning the heart and the queen, twice, I have to minus it off over here, subtract it off. The formula for P, A, or B can be rewritten. All we're doing is rearranging. And it can give you a formula for P, A, and B. So I'm solving this one up here for P, A, and B. We've classified events as mutually exclusive or not. You can also classify them as independent or dependent. If two events are independent, then the outcome of one event does not affect the probability of the other occurring. So if we look at two events of tossing a coin and rolling a die, say if you were looking at the probability of getting a head and rolling a six. What you get on the coin makes no difference to what's going to happen on the die. These are clearly independent events. If you try to draw two clubs from a deck without replacing, the fact that you drew a club the first time means that you're down one club and you're also down one card in the deck. So getting that first club has changed the probability of getting another club, meaning these are dependent events. If uh, events are independent, then the probability of A and B is just PA times PB. Okay, so if we're talking about flipping a head and rolling a six, we'd be looking at one and two probability of a head, one and six probability of a six, or a one in 12 chance of getting both head and a six. That only works for independent events. And that's also given in your formula booklet. It's one way to test whether events are independent. A conditional probability, we looked at it above. It's uh, often events that use the given that statements. A uh, guiding formula is called Bayes' theorem. We're looking at dependent events here. So if I rearrange this, I can actually put it this way. Probability of A and B is going to be probability A, given that B happened, times probability of B. Really similar to our formula for independent events, but we have to put the given then st that statement in, uh, because for dependent events, our probabilities change uh, based on what's happened with one event. All right, you want to be able to work with Venn diagrams and tree diagrams? So here would be an example question. Uh, 82 students at, in grade 12 at a school, 64 take math, and 56 students take Spanish, 12 students don't take either. Okay, so if I wanted to put this in my Venn diagram, I know for sure 12 don't take either. If I wanted to find out how many students take both math and Spanish, I could say, okay, probability of math and Spanish from back here 
the rearrangement of this formula would tell me that it's probability of math. Okay, probability of math was 64 out of 82. Plus probability of Spanish, 56 out of uh, 82. Minus probability of math or Spanish. Now, 12 students don't take either. That means 70 of them take math or Spanish. Uh, add these together, we're going to get 50 out of 82, which means 50 students. To be honest, that's probably not the way I'd go about solving it, um, but it's a good, fairly formal way to do it. What I would likely do is put in my 64 in math, put in my 56 in Spanish, and say, how many am I over by now? If I add up my numbers, I'm at 100. And 32 students, I should only have 82 students, meaning I'm over by 50. And that's the number that should go in the middle. So either one of those ways uh, will get you to these numbers. 50 students are taking both math and Spanish, meaning that 14 are taking just math and six are taking just Spanish. Given that a student takes math, what's the probability uh, that he or she does not take Spanish. Okay, does not take Spanish, given that he or she takes math. It's going to be the same as, this is from Bayes' theorem, Spanish and math, all over probability of math. Probability of Spanish and math, just from up there, is going to be 50 out of 8, or sorry, not Spanish and math. Not Spanish and takes math is 14 out of 82 over the probability of math, which is 64 out of 82. Divide those out, you get 14 out of 64, just multiplying by the reciprocal, or 7 out of 32. So that's a way to use Bayes' theorem to do this. Uh, another way that you could do it is you could say there are 64 students taking math, so I can call these math people. There are 14 math people not taking Spanish. So 14 out of 64, which would also get us to 7 out of 32. One way is a little more formal than the other. They'll both get you there. Show that M and S are not independent, meaning that they're dependent. Well, if M and S are, depend, are independent, then this should be true. Probability of math and Spanish should be the same as probability of math times probability of Spanish. Probability of math is 64 out of 82. Probability of Spanish is 56 out of 82. Okay, let's find out what that gives us. 64 out of 82 times 56 out of 82. 0.533. That's if they are independent. And this thing has to hold true, this equation. Probability of math times probability of Spanish equals probability of math in Spanish. In reality, though, probability of math and Spanish is 50 students out of 82. I wonder if that's the same decimal representation. 50 divided by 82, ah, uh, no, it's 0.610. Okay. So that's saying that probability of math and Spanish is not equal to probability of math times probability of Spanish. These can't possibly be independent. If they're independent, this has to hold true. So 
Standard deck of cards contains 52 cards and four aces. A student selects a card from a standard deck and records whether or not it's an ace. Without replacing the first card, he selects a second card and records whether it is an ace. Complete the following tree diagram. So probability of drawing an ace first is 1 out of 13, which just came from 4 aces out of 52. Probability of a non-ace is 12 out of 13, which came from 48 non-aces out of 52 cards. Now, if I've taken out one of my aces in my first draw over here, I'm down to three aces out of 51. Uh, if I get an ace, then a non-ace over here, I've still got 48 non-aces left out of 51. If my first card is not an ace, then I've got all four aces left out of 51 cards. It's down to 51 cards because we've taken one out in our first draw. And finally, if I have non-ace, then non-ace, that means I'm down to 47 non-aces out of 51. I can run this through in my calculator. I'm going to put them in here as uh, unreduced fractions. I'm just uh, multiplying top times top, bottom times bottom. If these were going to be your final answers on an IB assessment, you'd either want to give them correct to three sig figs or as a reduced fraction. Okay, so that first one would be one out of uh, 221. What's the probability of drawing no aces? Hmm. Well, it's right here, the path that led us from no ace to no ace. 564 out of 663. or roughly 0.851. What's the probability of drawing exactly one ace? Okay, well, that could mean no ace, then ace, which is this situation, or ace, then no ace, which is this situation. Since it's one case or another, we're going to be adding up these probabilities which gives us 96 over 663. And this is one of the reasons I left them as unreduced fractions, so it doesn't do a whole lot for us in this case. They're easy to add. If they all have the same denominator. 96 divided by 663, 0.145. Given that the first card's an ace, What's the probability of drawing another ace? So, probability that the second one's an ace, given that the first one is an ace. That's going to be the same as probability of both being aces. Over the probability that the first was an ace. Probability that they were both aces was 3 out of 663. Probability that the first was an ace was 1 out of 13. Flip and multiply, 39 out of 663, or 1 17th. Now, you might be saying, uh, there's an easy way to do that. Given that the first card is an ace, what's the probability of drawing another ace? It's right here in the tree diagram. 3 out of 51. That's the probability of drawing a second ace, which is the same as 1 out of 17. So you could have used the tree diagram to save yourself all that work and just written uh, 3 out of 51 equals 1 out of 17, or write it to three sig figs. Binomial probability distributions. These come up when a single event's repeated multiple times, and there are only really two outcomes, success or failure. Generally, we're going to say that there are n events, each with a probability p of success. And we're going to be looking for r successes. And this formula is in your formula booklet. 
where n is the number of events, r is the number of successes, and p is the probability of success. Uh, your binome PDF and binome CDF functions on your calculator, meaning binomial probability distribution function and uh, binomial cumulative, should be probability distribution function, uh, they can be used for all of this. Uh, but there are reasons to be conversant with all of the, all the ways of doing it, both this and the binome PDF and CDF. So we'll take a look at an example. Ian often has a coffee in class. Each day, there's a 91% chance he'll bring a coffee. What's the probability that he'll have exactly three uh, coffee at exactly three classes this week? So we're talking about uh, five classes, which assume five classes in a week. Uh, we have classes on weekdays here. So five events. I want to see success in three of them. And that five, three means five C3. A calculator. Probability of success. Well, it's 0.91 to the power of R, which is the number of successes. That's 3. 0 0.009 to the power of 2. If you're using a TI calculator, this is where you find the combinations. You go 5, math, over to PRB, down, down. 5C3, okay, that's 10. You might have known that from Pascal's triangle or from the formula for uh, combinations. At times 0.91 cubed times 0 0.09 squared. And we get 0 0.0610. Or roughly a 6.1 chance that there's coffee at exactly one class. Now, there's another way to approach this in your calculator. If we go to stat and the lists, I'm going to clear them out. What's the lowest number of coffees uh, or days Ian can bring coffee to class each week? Well, it would be zero. And it could go all the way up to five days. There's a probability distribution that goes with this. And if I go in my L2 heading, I can get at that probability distribution. It's second vars, and depending on your calculator, it'll be somewhere a little bit different in this uh, menu. But it says binome PDF, binomial probability distribution function. You need to tell your calculator two things. The number of events, which in this case is five, and the probability of success. What it does from there is let you know the probability of each possible event. So you can see right here that the probability of having exactly three days where there's coffee is 0 0.0610, exactly what we found. When you use this binome PDF, you need to tell it the number of events and the probability of success. Generally, that's a pretty good method for dealing with these binomial probability questions. What's the probability that he'll have coffee at at most two classes this week? Well, we could take probability of 0 plus probability of 1 plus probability of 2. I go to my calculator. Probability of uh, 0 is roughly 0.000006. Okay, because it was uh, 5.9 times 10 to the negative 6. Probability of 1 is going to be 3 to the, times 10 to the negative 4, which would be 0 0.0003. Plus probability of 2, uh, which if you go to your calculator, is 0 0.00604. Add them together, and we get 0 0.00634. Another approach to this would be to set up another column for your cumulative probability. So something similar, we go to the L3 heading, second vars, binome CDF this time, tell it the exact same information. There are five events, and 0.91 is our probability of success. And it tells me 
here, the probability of up to two days with coffee. So up to two successes. By the time we hit five, we're not surprised we have a probability of one because the probability of having uh, up to five days where you have coffee out of five has to be one. There's a 100% chance that you'll have somewhere between zero and five days. So if we went straight to binome CDF, you'd see your answer, 0 0.00634 right here. Probability of having classes at least three days this week, bunch of ways that you can do this. You could do probability of three plus probability of four plus probability of five from your binome PDF. I'm going to give you these numbers, uh, 6104. Uh, that was our probability of uh, three that we found up here, plus uh, 0.309 is the probability of four, right in your calculator. And probability of five is uh, 0 0.0624, or 0 0.624. Another way that you could approach it is to say probability of at most two, we just found was 0 0.00634. We could use the complement to find probability of at least three. So at least three, sort of the opposite event or complementary event to at most two. And since complements uh, probabilities add to one, we'd just be saying one minus this number here, probability of at most two. Two fairly straightforward ways of getting to this probability uh, of at least three classes. Okay. So from that, it looks like the binome PDF and the binome CDF are the best ways to approach these questions. But there are some that you can't answer that way. And this one here is a good example. Um, as you probably notice on the IB exams, you never know where the unknown is going to show up. It might not show up where it usually does on your standard questions. Uh, so Brett plays a game six times. The probability of winning exactly four games is 0.24. Huh. So there are six events, and we're interested in seeing four successes. We want to find the probability of winning a single game, or p. Well, this is going to be p to the fourth, 1 minus p to the power of 2. This is straight from our formula up here. The probability of those four wins is 0.24. And 6C4, if you work it out, uh, you'll get 15. It would be a foolish thing to try and solve this analytically. We go to our GDC. I do it graphically. I put in one side, 15x to the power of 4, 1 minus x, all squared. Then I'll put my other side of the equation, 0.24, in the other side. Uh, I know my window settings. Well, my maximum possible x value is going to be 1 here because it's a probability. can't be bigger than 1. My y's, uh, I'm looking at a, at a horizontal line that goes at 0.24. So I might go up to, I don't know, 0.4 or something. Oh. Two points of intersection. So I'll go second, uh, intersect, first curve, second curve. Looks like there's something around 0.5, and there is a solution at p equals 0.506. The reason that you'd want to have a decent window setting here is so that you can see there's also a second solution. Looks like it's around 0.8. Yeah, 0.805. That question wouldn't be possible with your binome PDF function on your calculator. Okay. Expected value. OK, these are questions that rely on probabilities and some sort of quantifiable value for each outcome. So we're often considering money here. If we have a game where a student rolls a cubicle die, 
Uh, if the die shows a six, the student won wins $9. If the die shows a one or a two, the student wins $6. If it shows three, four, or five, the student wins $1. The expected value of the game, and this is given in your formula booklet, uh, but probably the best way is just to have a, a basic understanding here of it being the sum of the probability of each event times its value. So, rolling a six, there's a one six chance of rolling a six, and that's worth nine dollars. So one six times nine plus die shows a one or a two, student wins six dollars. There's a one out of three or two out of six chance of getting a one or a two on your cubicle die times six dollars, which shows a three four or five. There's a one half chance or three out of six chance of showing three four or five. Student wins one dollar. So this is essentially 1.5 plus 2 plus 0.5, or 4. What that's telling you is that the average game is worth about 4 bucks, or well, it's worth $4. Now, no single game is actually going to win you $4, um, but if you play it again and again and again and again, you can expect the average game to be worth $4. Cost is four seventy-five to play. Is it a fair game? Fair means the cost of playing is the same as the expected value. So clearly in this case, no, it's not fair. It's a great game if you're the person running the game. It's not a great game if you're the person playing the game. Ralph plays the game 30 times. How much money do we expect him to win or lose? Well, it costs him 475 to play, uh, and he's got an expected return $4 on each game. Hmm. That means every game he's going to be losing 75 cents through 30 games. So we can expect a loss of 22.50. All right, normal distribution. If a random variable is normally distributed, then these are just some basic guiding principles. 68% of the population lies within one standard deviation of the mean. So I'm going to draw the normal distribution here. I'm trying to draw it symmetrically. Uh, unfortunately, my artistic skills are lacking. What you should know, though, is that it never actually touches the x-axis. The x-axis is an asymptote. In the middle of the graph, you'd have the mean, and we could move in standard deviations above and below the mean. It's symmetrical about the mean, even though, as I said, mine doesn't look perfectly symmetrical. So 68% of the population is going to be between uh, one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above the mean, right in here. 95% of the population is going to fall within two below and two above. And 99.7 are going to be within three standard deviations, meaning three above and three below. Uh, what that means for most questions is that you'd need a new curve for every scenario. But instead of doing that, we typically convert our scores to standard scores or Z scores. So these would be X's or raw scores that we're counting here. If we made the standard curve, the standard normal curve, we'd be looking at a curve that has a mean of zero and goes up by standard deviations. So a z-score of one means you're one standard deviation above the mean. Positive z-scores are above the mean. Negative z-scores are below the mean. The mean itself has a z-score of zero, and standard scores are computed with this formula that's given. The total area under the standard normal curve is 1.
A few things uh, that you can do to, to do these questions, or use to do these questions, rather, uh, is use the, your formula booklet, which has all those tables in the back, uh, or you can use your GDC and use the shade norm function or inverse norm function. Now, those might not be the only ways that you can uh, deal with these types of questions. They're the two that I happen to use. If you do something else that works well, great. So if we want to determine the area to the left of a z-score of 1.23, I often like to start by drawing the curve. There's my curve. A z-score of 1.23 is somewhere to the right of the mean. I'm looking at this area. With my calculator, what I do is set some decent window settings. So this isn't necessary. This is just so it'll look pretty. Go from negative 5 to 5. Y max of 0.4 sounds pretty good. I'm going to quit. Uh, and I go to uh, second and vars. And I'm going to draw with my shade norm. Now, it needs to give me a left boundary and a right boundary. Okay, my left boundary here is negative infinity. It keeps on going forever. But since the curve gets so close to the x-axis, as long as I put in some fairly large negative number, it's not going to make a difference, especially to three sig figs. So I'm looking at the area from negative 10,000 uh, or 100,000 as my standard deviation to the left of the mean, all the way up to 1.23. If I press enter, I'd still get that other graph in there. There we go. That looks more or less like what I drew and gives me an area of 0.891. I'm going to get rid of those graphs. Quit. To the right of a z-score of negative 0.53, okay, here's negative 0.53. So I'm looking for this area on the curve. I'll do the same thing. Uh, if I want to get rid of what I've got already drawn, I press second program and clear draw. Done. Second vars, I'm going to draw that shade norm again. Here, my left boundary is negative 0.53. 5, 3, and my right boundary is basically positive infinity, but if I, as long as I choose something pretty big, it'll look good. And that gives me an area of 0 0.702. Between a z-score of negative uh, 1.10 and 0 0.84, let's try that out. Again, I'm going to clear draw. I'll use shade norm, second vars, go over to draw between negative 1.1 and 0.84. Would have been nice if I had drawn it roughly this area. 0.664. Okay. We can do the same with the other ones. You may want to pause and do these. Realize that Z less than means to the left of. And if you run this through, you should get 0.966. Z greater than means to the right of. This would be a positive Z score. So you'd expect an answer here less than 0.5. Uh, and indeed, you get it, 0.378. And here, we're looking at between uh, negative 0.54 and 1.45. So this area, which is 0.632. All right, heights of high school basketball players are normally distributed with a mean of 177 and a standard deviation of 4. What's the probability that a randomly selected high school basketball player is taller than 182 centimeters? First thing we need to do in a question like this is find the standard score. Because otherwise, we can't use uh, our shade norm. We don't know what's going on with the standard normal distribution. So Z was equal to uh, X minus mu all over sigma, or the actual height minus the mean 
all over 4, which would give us 1.25. So that's how many standard deviations above the mean 182 centimeters relates to. We want people who are taller than that, so they're to the right of that score. Really what I'm looking for here is the probability of Z uh, being greater than 1.25. What that means in our shade norm, and again, I'm going to clear my old drawing, is we're going from 1.25 all the way up to infinity. Any fairly big number will do. And we get 0.106. What's the probability that a randomly selected high school basketball player is between 169 and 185 centimeters? Well, we're going to need the Z scores for each of these. You may want to pause and figure this out. When you do, you get a Z of negative 2 and a Z of 2. So we're looking for the probability that we're lying between negative 2 and 2. Clear the drawing. Shade norm from negative 2 all the way up to 2. We actually know what to expect here from our 68, 95, 99 rule. Roughly 95%. or 0.955. In a group of 250 high school basketball players, how many would be 182 centimeters or shorter? Well, we expected probability of uh, them being greater than 182 centimeters to be 0.106. So probability that their raw score is less than e equal to 182 is going to be 1 minus our probability that they're taller, or 0.894. We've got 250 of them. Each one has an 89.4% chance, percent chance of being uh, less than 182 centimeters, and that gives us 223.5. Okay, a test has a mean of 75 and a standard deviation uh, of 13. Results on the test are roughly normally distributed. 80% of test takers are expected to pass the test, find the passing mark. So really they're saying marks are normally distributed. There's some mark over here that 80% of test takers uh, are going to make, at least. And that means that 20% of test takers are going to fail it. If we look at that in terms of areas under the standard normal curve, this would be an area of 0.8 to the right, and an area of 0.2 to the left of whatever mark that we're interested. I don't know, we could call it A or K. So there's some mark over here. Looks like we want a score that has an area of 0.2 to its left. The Z score that corresponds to this is, you can go to inverse lookup in your formula booklet, or you can do it in your calculator. Second vars, go down to inverse norm, and just tell it the area. So with inverse norm, you tell it area to the left of this score, and it gives you the corresponding Z score. Corresponding Z score is negative 0.842. The last thing we need to do is transfer this into a raw score. 
And here's what we're going to need to use. Z score, which we know is negative 0.842, is the raw score, which we don't know, minus the mean, all over the standard deviation of 13. If you take a second and solve that, you'll get X is 64.1. The last one's just sort of left as an exercise for you. Probability that a student scores lower than 88 uh, means you're going to have to find the Z score. So I suggest you just pause and uh, work through this yourself and then check it out. That's going to mean a Z score of 0.727. And the probability that Z's less than 0.727 from your calculator is going to be 0.766. Percentage of students that scored between 65 and 88. So this corresponds to a Z score of negative 1.36. This we knew already was 0.727. It's a probability that Z lies between negative uh, 1.36 and 0.727. Work it through in your calculator, and you're going to get 0.913. Probability that X is greater than 65. Again, we know what Z score that corresponds to, so we go second, bars, shade norm, negative 1.36, all the way up to a big positive number. Notice it's drawing over my old one this time. It doesn't look very nice, but it will still calculate the area properly. And even if you had a horrible uh, if you had a horrible uh, window setting, you'd still get this. Uh, I'm sorry, the point 0.913 was the right answer for this. B should have been 0.679. And lastly, what mark did 90% of them score above? Okay, this is very similar to the last example example two when you work it through we should get 65.9 thanks for listening